start properly. Okay. Um, so thank you very much um, uh, for being here. Uh, so today's presentation will be given by, uh, and now we've just talked about uh, how to pronounce names and I find this very hard. I'll try my best. Uh, so Ayodele James Akinola. Uh, he's an uh, early career researcher in digital humanities, pragmatics, discourse analysis and culture studies. Uh, he has a PhD in English language from the uh, University of uh, Ibadan in Nigeria. And he's an emerging researcher with publications in computer mediated communication, pragmatics, rhetoric and digital humanities. He lectures at the Christland University in Abuekuta, and he's a program officer at the University of Lagos Center for Digital Humanities uh, in Nigeria as well. His uh, personal and collaborative research engagement, uh, engagements include discursive complexities uh, of colonial literature, and I think he's actually going to talk about that today as well. Uh, humor and misinformation in new media, digital humanities evaluation of COVID-19 induced e-learning encounters of Nigerian students, online public health campaigns on COVID-19, linguistic investigation on hashtags among, uh, among Nigerian netizens, etc. Uh, his uh, research philosophy is premised on the belief that theories in the, uh, in the human sciences ought to always apply to real life situations. He's presented his works at academic gatherings across, across continents of Africa, Europe and North America. Uh, so I hope that's a good enough uh, introduction. I'm very, very interested in your presentation. So James, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Um, I just go straight to the point and then um, I hope you will all enjoy the, the session. Just a moment, I want to share my screen. Okay, so today, just like it was mentioned during the introduction, um, I'll be talking to us about the resources, scholarship, and digital humanities uh, practice. We will we'll focus on, the, on my experience regarding how we are able to cope, as and um, which is typical of an African scholar. Um, then let us, I'm not going to try to define what digital humanity is, um, but uh, we will get into the uh, description as we go on. But uh, I, I think I should bother myself about what digital humanity is not. Um, and then we'll say that digital humanity is not always quantitative research uh, regarding the methodology. It is not always quantitative research. It is not always expecting technology to be a tool to make humanity research easier and faster. Uh, it's not an overdependence on technology or uh, saying that everything has to be done uh, through uh, technology or uh, making our work faster, just put it in there and just forget about it. Let it do it for you. That is not digital humanity. And digital humanity is not a theoretical framework. It is not a theory uh, that you apply to a uh, certain um, 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 concept or, or variable. Um, neither is it a uh, computer science. So we shouldn't mis make mistake about it. Digital humanity is not computer science. It is a field of study on its own. So what then is digital humanity? Um, when you are involved with large amount of information, you are thinking of what to do about this. You are talking digital humanity. And as a, as, as a humanist, if you are looking for skills to help you do your work in a more um, appreciable way, in a more comprehensive way or convincing way or scientific way, um, if, you have, if you are looking for that skills or you, are, you have that skills, then we can begin to see you as a digital humanist. Um, but basically, when you talk digital humanities, you talk about digital humanity in the digital age, which involves the use of information technology as an auxiliary collection of techniques to help solve humanistic problems. Then, humanistic object of study 
and or humanistic re or, and study of humanistic relevance rather than being related to information technology will be what we are talking about when we talk digital humanity. Then you should know that digital humanity is not a, a, a mountain on its own. It is not. It is not a tree in the forest. Yeah. So it's it's a combination of other disciplines. So it is best done. As, it is best seen as an interdisciplinary. interdisciplinary. Okay. Um. Um. Then we have this from DreamTimes.com. Um. All sort of things that we can really look at and say. Um. These are things that we do in digital humanities. When we talk about um, uh, uh, volume of quantity of analytics, we are talking digital humanities. Even business asset analysis, digital humanities. So these are the uh, common terms that you may uh, also come across when we talk digital humanities. I I'm doing this um, with the understanding that there are people who are up, up, come, up and coming, and there are experts here. So in promoting digital humanities, we have to uh, balance that. OK, so digital humanities, what are those methods, processes, and activities? I'll vitamize some of these uh, based on um, established studies. Um, one of them is that you re, uh, when, you, when, when you have recorded source materials into a da database, uh, usually from an archive, that is one of the processes of digital humanity. That's one of the activities. I have a lot of them on this page. Um, when you are also talking about digitizing and preserving archives, that is digital humanity. When you conduct interviews or carry out an eth ethno ethnographic studies, usually coded for thematic and discourse analysis, which is what many of us are doing presently, we are talking DH. Transcribing manuscripts, letters, etc., for a digital scholarly uh, edition, including Virium and then genetic edition. That is one of our methods. Co when you do coding of data for either qualitative and distance uh, reading method, including code books and domain ontologies, this is it. When you are involved in analyzing large archives such as newspaper journals and picture libraries we are talking digital humanities um what about compiling and, 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 and analyzing social media content um just like i, I was introduced uh, i was it was mentioned during the introduction um this is a very um interesting part of my engagement in digital humanity which i believe i want to develop so much uh, compiling and analyzing social media content. It's, it, 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 there are a lot of uh, information out there, but what are we doing with them? So um, when we talk DH, I think we should begin to think about that too. So um, I continue, compiling and annotating audiovisual audio -visual database, audio images and then video. Um, another method, when you have massive technology such as 3D virtual reconstruction, augmented reality, and virtual worlds, there are a lot of examples in even in, in Africa. You know, there are a lot of examples of this. Um, there is also the part of crowdsourcing, uh, which we call citizen science. You know, these are part of methods, uh, processes, and activities uh, that we talk about in digital humanity. Um, when you are also in, you can, you can do this humanities by being involved in web app development, mobile app development, website, virtual exhibition, online research resources, or you have a user generated content in talk digital humanities. You can also have map based approaches such as historical GIS and working tour apps. There are a lot of works on, uh, on this part too. Um, then we have purpose linguistic. They are they are um, translation studies and other approaches to language study, whether it's written or it is uh, spoken. We we these are also interest in digital analytics processes and method. Okay, and finally, uh, we'll talk about data visualization of humanities content, such as social network diagrams and cluster diagrams. You know, when 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 you 
finish some of these work. Well, sometimes you, you use you visualize them on the uh, on the internet for the human world to see and and so on and so forth. So a lot of things that are done in digital humanities, and I know that there are many experts here. Um, but for those up and coming, these are things that we call method processing and activities of digital humanities. Now let's quickly talk about DH in Africa or DH of Africa. Of, of course, uh, this picture I took it from the internet. I don't even know which country where I tried to get the source, but it's from Getty Image. Um, um, but um, sometimes this is a uh, kind of Africa we desire. I know some people will argue now that, well, they don't want that this kind of Africa. It's too, it's too technological driven, but that's what many of us want. Okay, so DH in Africa, how far have we gone? How far have we gone? You see, um, the 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 the, uh, the lecture this morning or the, the, my speech this morning, uh, if you remember, is about the resources, scholarship, and resilience. If if there must be resilience, it means that we are trying to cope with this with certain things that we want that we cannot get. So um, DH in Africa has not really gone so much uh, so far. Um, and then I bring out this map from dhcenternet.org, okay? And then to just show us what, uh, in, uh, what role, uh, uh, the, the developmental stage or the, 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 the way DH in Africa has gone so far. So in this, you see that uh, on the continent of Africa, there are only two uh, countries and that is South Africa, and Nigeria. Um, and we, we look at it, you see that in South Africa, based on my analysis on the other side, uh, there is a lot of government involvement and there's some form of foreign partnership. But uh, in Nigeria, there is only, there is no government involvement in digital humanity research. Uh, what we have is uh, institutional, institution based. And then we have just a center at the University of Lagos and one in the North Central that is more or less an institution based. I'll come to that during my, um, uh, my, my sample analysis. Then um, from colleagues in other parts of Africa, we see that um, uh, 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 there, is no, there is no support or limited support in, in most cases. Um, and what we do just have is a uh, Based on individual hard work, um, they are able to sustain what we can call digital humanity in Africa. So, what then? Okay, um, this this shows um, a chart of what's going on in Africa regarding DH initiatives, funding, and scholarship. You see that the 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 purple, the purple is a uh, uh, government, and you could see that in each of in, in each of the cases, uh, in each of the cases, um, it's is the lowest. For instance, in initiative, uh, you could see it's very barely up, not up to uh, two percent of of the total um, um, support that you may get regarding initiative. But what we have there, the the yellow bar is that of the individual, but uh, we have a lot of support. Uh, um, I mean, we have a lot of initiative being made by uh, individual, which is uh, uh, by external body, which is represented uh, with the blue bar. Then the funding, you'll be surprised that external body takes the, uh, the, the plays the, the most important role in funding digital humanities uh, research in Africa. Um, because of the potentials that the continent of Africa offers. Um, then um, you look at funding there, you see that the government is, uh, it still occupies its lowest uh, level. Then individual, well, people with personal funding grants here and there, they are able to do some of these things. When I talk about the coping strategy, you should bear this in mind. For, for the execution of projects, of course, we've seen a lot of individuals carrying out some of these projects, despite that they were sponsored by um, 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 external bodies 
and then some fine institution. Okay, and then there we have the individuals doing very well. Okay, then for scholarship, in terms of training, retraining, and all this, well, we, what we have in Africa is mainly um, about external funding, and except for South Africa, that has some support from government, and it's because of South Africa that we have um, the government involvement there in the in the last column of this bar that got, got up uh, more than the rest. But in other parts of Africa, it's almost non-existent. Okay, so now regarding the last part, where, which I talked about here, the scholarship, you then see the involvement. There, there was uh, this um, workshop in Leiden last year, uh, involving uh, focusing on Africa, organized by uh, the University of Leiden. Um, and the ABHO and some other partners. And you can see the involvement from the continent of Africa. You see the South Africa uh, participant occupying the larger role. Uh, that is to tell you that the impact of uh, uh, the, 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 the situation in South Africa regarding BH is much better than every other part in Africa. Then Nigeria is trying to catch up so they have about 28 percent of these participants. Then uh, Uganda surprisingly had uh, the next uh, higher number of participants. But um, DH scholarship in Uganda is not is nothing so much to really talk about at the moment. But mm -hmm. I know of uh, colleagues that are doing some works in DH. Okay, so um, now. What are the opportunities that we can find in uh, DH scholars, uh, scholarship, even on the, on the continent of Africa? For those who are interested, who are enthusiastic, okay, we, we, there is, of, of course, international training, there is workshop and a lot of scholarship opportunity. There, there are a lot of summer, summer schools going on in Africa. For instance, there is a summer school coming up in Nigeria in, in early part of next year. Okay, if not for the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, I, I know a lot of such initiatives will have uh, uh, been experienced this year. Okay, so we have DH community, which is uh, more positive uh, uh, stuff coming from this continent. We have DH community. Of course, the umbrella body is the ADHO, that's Alliance uh, for Digital Humanity Organization. Okay, and then there is humanistic as, in Humanistica covers the French speaking part. I, and when you check their website, you see that Humanistica is based in Belgium. Uh, I mean, it's headquartered in Belgium. So it's not a true reflection of the African involvement of, um, of uh, African involvement in DH. Okay, but when we then talk about real um, involvement of Africans in DH, we can begin to talk about the Digital Humanity Association of South Africa. That's DASA. Now, Nigeria is also doing a lot uh, through the Digital Humanity Association of Nigeria. Then um, you can see the picture on the right, which is um, uh, the, 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 the participants from the lighting workshop uh, in the Netherlands. Um, and then after the workshop, they are able to form uh, a major DH community in Africa, which, is, which we call Network for Digital Humanities in Africa. They are, the website is there. If you just do a Google search, uh, you find you find a Network for Digital Humanities in Africa. They also have present on Facebook and I'm a member of the group, okay? So now talking about DA centers in um, Africa, um, that offer some of these leverages that people who are interested in digital managers can actually uh, pick on. We, we, the, the foremost is Sadila. It's the first of its kind in the continent of Africa. But I, I know that it was uh, sponsored by the government and it's, it has been able to attract some other international donors and fundings. I mean, funders, I mean, um, those who so financial sponsor rather to itself. And then CEDAW, which is Center for Digital Humanity uh, in, uh, at University of Lagos. 
Okay, so um, it's also it's also doing very well in the western part of Africa. Okay, so basically, what's what DH in Africa offers us is that it it offers international training, workshop, and scholarship. There are a lot of summer schools, just like, like I mentioned. There are DH communities that any, any interested individuals can grow, and then there are DH centers um, that you can actually get in touch with and you get up. Then majorly, um, there is this uh, what we call collaborative research, which I'm going, also going to talk about much later. You know, um, DH in Africa. That's that's what it offers anyone who is interested, whether you have been practicing or you, you, you just want to come into the, uh, to the field. So, but let me quickly talk about my personal reflection. Um, of course, some of the things I've been talking about, they are my personal reflection, but I want to just do a sample analysis of uh, what I have been able to do regarding DH in Africa, how somebody might get inspired and then um, go ahead and do much better than some of us are already doing. So I pick on the topic, uh, the G2 humanities and discursive complexity of colonial literature. You know, the, this study was influenced by um, one of my visits to one of the archival centers in Nigeria. And I, and I discovered that uh, what you have here, and I saw letters between, written between the colonial masters and the chiefs, colonial master and governors, uh, just lying away. Some you see, um, you see them just looking on kept. And I asked myself, what can we do? Can we can we not digitize this? And then um, I tried to first look at the contents and then do a textual analysis of uh, this. So um, quickly, I then talk about what colonial letters are, okay, in this, in, this, in this talk. So of course, colonial letters are a means of communication among colonial masters in the middle part of the world, especially Africa, between the 1870s and 1900. Then it, it then served as a medium of extending thought, feelings, or information between the ruling colonial masters and colonized subject of vice versa. Um, of course, for us, what's important is uh, uh, the colonial letters, which I call colonial literature. You know, uh, what does it hold for us? It's a reliable source for analyzing Africa's encounter with Europe, owing to the historical antecedent and cultural values of those letters. Okay, now, colonial letters, uh, colonial. I, I won't. I won't bother us with all this. Let me just move on. So uh, the objective, just like I mentioned, I want to look at. I want to collect archive colonial letters that are in Nigeria or that are relating to Nigeria. Uh, I want to identify the various discursive or pragmatic pattern that shape the complexity, and um, I also examine. Yes, yeah, something I have done. How they assist in the understanding of colonial thoughts. Then I want to interrogate, interrogate the effectiveness of this letter to modern day pedagogy. What can we learn from them? Can we use them for teaching? Um, what are the potentials for the description of African social, cultural, and then linguistic value in the study location? You know, um, these are the things that I, uh, I, I set out to do in, the, in that research. And then that paper was presented at Michigan State University program earlier in the year. Okay. Now let's talk about experience um, from the colonial letters. Um, I discovered that DH projects in Nigeria, they are mainly either institution, institution based, you know, um, like I said, government uh, don't they don't enjoy uh, DH projects don't enjoy government support at the moment. And then we'll continue to drive the narratives and sometimes maybe we'll get them. So in the Southwest, there is only Center for Digital Humanities like mentioned earlier, and talking about Nigeria now. And then there is another one in the North Central State of Quara, where we have Center for Digital Archive of African Mother Tongue Languages. 
Um, and if I, if I may shock you, this center is not doing anything in relation to digital humanity at all, uh, in terms of identifying themselves with DH in Africa. There is nothing, there, there is no, no, no collaboration of sort, you know, with the center. So we'll, we'll, try, we'll try to see if we can bring them in and then so that we can continue the collaboration. So um, now, from the centers, from, from, from my experience, I noticed that one of those things that are impairing um, against uh, DHA or in this part of the world, our economy is one. Uh, and then the economy, we of course, influence our infrastructure. Sorry, I just want to plug my connection. Um, it also has impact on them. Then, then, then people, people in DH are also bothered that when I finish, where am I going to be useful? You know, the employment. I, I, I think I talked about this even later. Then, then the obsolete, obsolete uh, archival culture is there. Then uh, we don't have that practitioner as such. And then the lack of standard method of access to the public. Um, and access to work at some archival centers make my research difficult, uh, you know, to really exchange, I mean, to really get gain access to colonial letters. Okay, so um, this is one of those centers I visited. I, 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 I the, 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 this center uh, is the national, is nationally owned. Of course, what they do is just to uh, keep record of all the archivable stuff that they have based on the region. So they have this in virtually the six geopolitical regions in Nigeria. Okay, so um, this is the center, but I had a na nasty experience when I went there. Um, this is um, the center I went in here and I did not meet anyone on that, on that day. I wanted to do a research on colonial letters I moved in the, the letters, some of the some of the documents you can see them um, on the on the floors, um, on the table, in the in, on the shelf. Some were locked up. You can see this. Some were locked up. Some were just lying parallel there. Um, and then the worst case scenario was that it was difficult to even find anybody to talk to. You know, I had to go over and over and over and over before I was able to talk to someone um, on that day, uh, on other days that I went. So, um, um, but I want to quickly uh, tell us, if you want to do this kind of research, it is not impossible. Um, perhaps I was not lucky when I went, um, but if you want to do this kind of research or you want to collect um, uh, so, um, in archivable information from the National Archive, you can, these are the procedures. Um, for, first, you will go to the applications. Uh, you, you submit an application to the center, you wait, it will take weeks, it will take days, it depends. And I wouldn't want to say more on that, you know, but you have to wait for approval. Then you have to pay to access the place. Then you have to be on a, an appointment for the access the day you are going to come and then do whatever you want to do. Then, you will then have to go do what I, I called manual catalog comparison, and then you start making notes, and then you have to go over and over and over. Um, then the most difficult part is the payment for the digital scanning, or you make photocopy of each page. You, you cannot be allowed to um, maybe take out those things, no matter how credible you may look. Um, you have to. Uh, allow them to do it and it might not be, the, the pay might not be favorable to you. Okay, so um, these are the, some of the stuff I was able to scan and I subjected them to um, contextual analysis and then uh, uh, digital analysis of content. For the digital analysis, I use Anton and the R Studio and then later um, for the, um, for the contextual analysis, I applied the theoretical 
a framework of pragmatics. You know, just like I mentioned, digital humanity is not a theoretical framework. So you cannot even apply, uh, try to apply it to uh, a, a study. So it's just a body of knowledge that you can really utilize a lot of tools that are inherent in it. So um, for pragmatics, pragmatics explains how language users are able to overcome um, apparent ambiguity uh, by relying on what the speaker say in that in, in, in the speech situation in terms of what time is this the speech said, what is the manner, and then what kind of text is used. If I if I talk um, uh, verbally, it might be different when I write. So for pragmatics, such things will be looked at. Okay, and then there is a model of pragmatics, um, the, the popular one by Jacob May, uh, that is called Pragmen, and then it has all these features, but I'm not going to bother us with all these theoretical uh, stuff now. And then um, from th that uh, um, Pragmen, I was able to um, uh, adapt it to um, what I would say my own kind of framework, and I was able to deduce from the data for in the field, some of these, for example, I said that um, the inference from the data, that is the colonial letter, we could see that inferences were made to the colonial administrators, and then there is community talks and so on and so forth. Then you can see traceable names, when we talk about reference, you know, you can see traceable names of people, cities, events, and then a reply to a previous letter, and then based on the need of the movement. Uh, then the relevance, you see the, the role of intervention, there is need based. There are a lot of issues that the colonial letters offer us. In, in fact, it's, it's such a very wonderful resource. It's a very useful resource that I think um, it deserves all the attention that people within and outside can give, uh, give to it. But, Regarding voice, you can see that the relationship between the subordinate and uh, and and the, the leaders there. You can see that relationship in terms of authority, in tone of the letter. You can see the, uh, the superiority. You can see sometimes the issue of friendship. You know the mutuality. You can find it there. And then you can see that in that in, in shared situation knowledge. We see that it's mostly parallel. If time were to be sufficient, I, I, I might still go back to what, to just give an exam, example from this letter so that you get an idea of what I'm talking about. What I just know that I'm talking to the generality of people, and then and then there are people who are interested in this. But the bottom line is just to understand that if humanities are uh, in different perspective, uh, different aspects. Then you can apply your knowledge from a particular field of study to digital humanity, and that's very key for me. So um, going ahead with my um, um, with my framework, um, I talk about metaphor, the metaphor of people, the, that of environment and infrastructure. Then the meta pragmatic joker cannot be there because um, it is restricted in this in, in this form. And then since this is a textual uh, a text-based analysis, you will not find a uh, metapragmatic joker there. So um, all this, all this, you know, the 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 topic then was a uh, colonial complex, uh, uh, discussing complexity. All this that Rafan led to the complexity of need for abolition of human sacrifice. So you can see that subject there. You can see non-compliance by some of the subject. That's why like that the 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 letter promulgated that, that no more human sacrifice, you know, so some, are, some of these are the content that you find in those letters. Then um, there is also the issue of tackling and reducing spread of decision. You know, these are things that you find from the letter, the settlement of conflict between warring communities, there is the administration policies and government businesses, there is that expansion of territorial powers, there is also religious activities and, pol uh, and policies. You know, in terms of what you do, what you don't do. So, um, based on that study, I could see, I, I could also, um, I was able to apply ANCON, you know, ANCON now. This is very important to those who are up and coming for um, 
uh, those who are interested in DH, um, there is the application of Antcon. Antcon is not that difficult to use, just study within some a few times you get to use Antcon. So for when I use Antcon, I was able to bring out certain things. For me to use Antcon, I have to transcribe. I have to use OCR. Um, I can't remember the short form, I mean the full name now. Now, OCR, when you, you, you I extracted the text from the from the materials, then put it back into an, an editable format, then you punch that in into your antcon, you know, you segment them, you punch them in into your antcon, and the antcon is able to analyze uh, different things for you. And I was able to measure, measure relationship and then the voice, that is that relationship between the, the, the leaders, uh, the, the address and the addressee. You know, the writer and the person that is addressed to. Now, I push, push in, punch in some words into Anton to find um, this relationship and the voice that were uh, fine. So I, I, I use, and these are the words. So when you punch all this in, look at this. For instance, I punch inform or oblige or privilege. Look at this. So we're able to get this. I'm happy to inform you that, you know, um, that uh, do my promise that I will inform your excellency. So you can see the one I'm happy to inform you that, you know, you can, if you look at the full text, you can then begin to understand the, re re the relationship between the writer and the, the, the person that the letter is addressed to. Uh, you look at oblige to, you know, if you oblige us this rare privilege, whereby conform to letters. So the other one, you can easily see that is is written by a subordinate, you know, that is feeling privileged to get something to the superior, you know, and so on and so forth. So I, I, I move on to conclusion on that paper. And I say that there are many pedagogical relevance of colonial letters that you can find just on that paper. You can find the discourse patterns. You can see the historical authenticity of the letter that they were truly what happened in, in the history of um, the, the environment that the letter was extracted from. Then you can see the relationship with the past, in, which also helps enable the understanding of colonial thought. I can see, just like I emphasize, social roles and voices then and now. In fact, in this study, I was able to see that there is no much difference between the relationship between leaders of the contemporary Nigerian state and the leaders of, during the colonial master. There is that disparity in terms of authority, you know, use of power and, and so on and so forth, you know. So, and then what, what gave me this? It's TH. Pragmatists perhaps might not have given it that alone. So, and then, and then say that this digitalized colonial literature needs to be encouraged and in research and as it can form an invaluable resource so as to ensure easy access to teaching and learning. Because if we are, I'm able to use it for my students, for instance, students of English, students of history, students of English can learn vocabularies from me. Students of history can learn history, politics can learn political science, and so on and so forth. So um, um, it's like I mentioned, it sustains the historical value of the document and it, it protects its rich nature for predicting the future. And then humanity courses like history, classic, creative writing, and so on can also find um, something from that. Then, yes, you have, you have, I have carried out that work. So, the hour, despite what. Now, after carrying out that work, what can we learn from me? I've mentioned that. Um, then for a DH researcher, what do you what do you do? What do you do? So um, you should know that basically in Nigeria, in Af in, and in most parts of Africa, um, there is coping strategy. That's what I want to talk about. The coping strategy of um, um, DH is mainly institutional and then maybe individualized, you know, you have to, you have to be determined that this is a must to do 
and I have to do it. Okay, so um, the first thing that you need to put in being a scholar in DH, I'm talking to the young, uh, to, to those who are coming up and coming up. The first thing you need to do is to have passion for humanity and ICT based research. You know, you want to have, deploy the technology to your research, the different things. You want to deploy technology to your research. So, um, uh, there is an application of interdisciplinary theories. Okay, um, you are ready to apply other concepts, other uh, um, philosophies from other discipline to your room. I mean, to your study. So, so um, if you are able to do that, if you are ready to do that, and you have your clear method, you will be able to cope and even stand uh, stronger in digital humanity then there is no way I think that you can cope efficiently without having some form of mentorship. Now we have DH community, so it is easier now than before to find mentors in the digital humanities. Um, I'm sure that if you uh, contact people in Sadila, in Sedo, and some other DH projects or initiatives that are springing up, I'm sure you're going to get uh, mentored your the kind of mentorship that you have. Um, in, in, in talking about mentorship, don't forget you may have to attend training and and then um, uh, and summer schools. Some of them are free, mainly they are free. Uh, the one in Nigeria, I think it was sponsored by a body in Jami, and because of that, I think it's almost free. But people apply that it's going to be restricted to those who apply. No. The, 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 then for to be a successful um, um, DH scholar, uh, and then you want to cope, uh, you have to be devoted and committed to information, uh, information. That is, you search and search over and over. Um, basically, for instance, I, I was not trained formally in DH, but I attended summer schools training, and I was privileged to be mentored by some of these people, uh, Julia Baby, for example, uh, created that avenue for us to be well mentored. And that's why we are here talking to you today. So um, then you cannot do DH if you don't have basic knowledge of computer. It is not possible. Just basic knowledge. If you can operate your phone and you can copy and paste and then uh, download certain uh, software and then you know basic things, basic computing knowledge. I, I think you just need those things. You don't have to be a programmer, okay? Although it is a very good skill, uh, it's a very good skill for you to acquire. And then if you want to cope in this field, it's good. If it is HTLM, if it is just Python, the basic part, just like some of us are doing, you, you can. You can you can actually explore it. Then there is no way to survive in DH without collaboration, because where your knowledge ends is where some other people's knowledge begins. So you have to really collaborate, seek collaboration. Um, don't be um, don't be a, 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 a um, don't be a, 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 a tree in the forest. Don't be don't be untrainable, don't be unadvisable. I, I think you just need to collaborate. That's why I repeated collaboration, collaboration, collaboration. Then um, I'm rounding off in a very few minutes. So if we can sustain uh, the momentum of even our resilience, our, our, despite all the infrastructural decay, uh, all the challenges we are going through, we can really, we can really take DH beyond what others uh, are expecting from us. I can tell you, uh, dear Africans or people, researchers who are interested in Africa, if you don't do it yourself, nobody is going to do it for you. Some of these applications we are using want to produce our own, want to do our own, uh, want to uh, develop our own app uh, application, want to uh, uh, develop an application that will be useful to our own uh, text so that even the whole world can then begin to use uh, some of these things, just like we are using those of others. And I think 
that should even be one of the goals of DH. With that, uh, with that, uh, with that, I will want to say thank you for your attention, and I hope um, that um, you have had a wonderful time with me. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I personally really enjoyed uh, your presentation. I think there's a lot of information in there. Um, I actually have a few a few questions, but I'd very much like to open the floor to all the other um, uh, participants. So if you have questions, please uh, write them in the chat and then we can use that as a as a starting point for a discussion. We still have about 10 minutes left, so there's um, yeah, I think there's time for discussion. Okay, I don't see any questions yet. So think about if you have questions, put the, okay, Johannes. Sibeko has, at least says hi. <laughs> I'm not sure if he has a question. Otherwise I can quickly squeeze one in while he's writing a question. So I was actually, um, uh, intrigued by your oh oh yeah okay so as Johannes uh, has a question so could James please elaborate on the politics of employment I think that's an interesting one as well uh, thank you for your question yes the politics of employment um, apparently in other fields of study um, it's it's a struggle to get employed okay in, even if you study medicine in many parts of where I came from, you know, even if you study medicine, you might struggle to get employed. Um, um, then, if I then say I want to study or I want to be a specialist in DH, government is not supporting DH. That's politics on its own. So, how do I get employed? Well, you know, I mentioned a center that the, uh, that is into archiving of information, digital information, and it's not doing DH. You know, so. Um, you go to such a center, you say, I want to get employed. I, want, I can do this, I can do that. They... Um, perhaps you need to study all that stuff. I hope you understand. So I, I missed your last part. I'm not sure if it was the connection or if it was uh, the connection on my okay. side. Okay, let, let me take it again. I was talking about it. I said, um, employ, get, gaining unemployment might be, it might, it's even a challenge presently, even when you do um, a much uh, popular, when you are from a much a more popular field of study like medicine, um, law, and so on and so forth. So if you then, tell someone, I, I mentioned um, a center that is into digital archive and is not doing DH, you know? So if you get to such a center, you say, oh, I'm a DH researcher. I want to work with you. Um, I'm satisfied, I, I, I'm, I'm satisfied, and then this and that. And then it tells you, no, I don't know what you're talking about. You didn't study the contemporary stuff that we know about. So, uh, uh, sorry, you can't get employed here. So the politics, because the government is not even seeing DH, they don't even understand what is DH. So it might be challenging for someone to really gain employment. So because of that, some who we naturally want to go into DH are skeptical. And so am I going to get employed at the end of the day? Or even can, I, can this better my life? That's the point. Okay, wonderful. So this actually kind of ties in with the question that I had. Um, so you, you've given an overview of the things that happen in DH in, in Africa. So there, there are things going on. Um, but, but now you say, well, uh, there are a lot of people who don't really, still don't really know exactly what it is or what you can do with it. So do, do you think, are we doing enough, uh, to kind of boost digital humanities in Africa or if not, what, what, what should we do? Should we get governments involved? Should we forget about government because they're not doing anything and do it ourselves or how should we get institutions going uh, how, how should we do this yeah. 
Um, there are a lot of uh, uh, um, space, uh, spaces to cover. And then, but if you tell me, are we doing badly? I'll say no. But given the opportunity, given the privilege of infrastructure, resources, funding, uh, Africa would do much greater than even the rest of the world with DH. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Uh, are there any more questions? Oh, I see another question here. So what is the uniqueness of digital humanities um, when compared to what has been on ground before? Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Yes, I was wondering okay, if it was I, my connection or yours. Okay. Yes. Uh, uh, DH is unique on its own because it is um, basically the humanistic way of solving problems, uh, human problem using uh, digital tools. You know, um, computer science may not may not do what we do in digital humanity. Computer science, we only, um, for example, give us software to do certain things based on the understanding of people in that field. But because what we do in art is quite different from what the sciences do, um, it's, it's, that makes a DH a very unique uh, field of endeavor, uh, whereby um, we, 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 we concentrate Assist on the artistic value uh, of the human aspect and then try to put that into digital form and then make a lot of uh, technological uh, advancement through that. And I think that, you know, that alone is a lot of uniqueness. You know, you do not want to do cultural heritage, for example. Um, computer science may not be <laughs> interested in that. You want to archive information. Computer science may just put it in a way that may not be accessible to a typical humanist, you know, but DH is making all those things to be very easy and then more accessible and easily understand, uh, understood to people in the, in the, in the, in the, in the in that's, even laymen can understand, yeah, that's fine. Right. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, that was quite uh, insightful. Um, okay, let me see. Now things are happening in the uh, in, in in the chat. Uh, so Ruweder says, "Thank you for your presentation, James. You mentioned the importance of collaboration. How can we best ensure that the DH community does not work in isolation on similar projects?" Can you repeat the question, please? Yep, sure. So Ruwele says, um, thank you for your presentation. You mentioned the importance of collaboration. How can we best ensure that the DH community does not work in isolation on similar projects? Best use in DH because there was a fluctuation in network connection. Then, um, is that is that what you asked? Okay, so now I missed your connection. So it's about uh, how can we make sure that we collaborate and not work in isolation? Yes. Well, luckily for us, there are a lot of DH communities that are coming up. I think as a DH researcher, the first thing is to join one of these communities. For example, the digital humanities. Uh, Network for Digital Humanities in Africa is a free to join as a group of people. It's not even yet an organization, you know. So you join, you look out for such join, and you can get a, a reach out to people too. Uh, I, I don't understand fully the the operation of Sadila, but I, I'm sure that uh, they make collaborative work to uh, very uh, possible too for people. But I know that. Um, on a personal level, 
uh, when you a, a, an, a, a DH enthusiast finds uh, a project to do, I think the best way is to just reach out to others in the field and then see, uh, then design uh, what uh, a template for the project and listen to other other people's ideas and then you you you, you I'm sure that you can enjoy um, so much of collaboration from others. I think there is a question from Ruth Weather. Yeah, that was actually that question that you just answered. Okay. <laughs> so okay. Thank you for that. And I think Leonay also had a question, but I think you've answered that uh, as well. So how how can you approach this collaboration? But I think you've just answered that. Um, I also see that it's just past eleven. Uh, I think um, some people have uh, other appointments, unfortunately, as well. Uh, I think um, so. Perhaps I'm, I'm I'm giving away too much now, but I think you're open to collaboration as well, right? So if people are interested in collaborating, they can probably contact you. Uh, they can also definitely contact Sadilar. Um, so just to 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 end this, I mean, I think we can talk for hours, um, but like I said, some people have. Uh, other appointments. I would very much like to thank you for this wonderful presentation. I very much enjoyed it. Uh, it gives a lot of insight in 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 your work, the problems that you have, um, and and the techniques that you're using. So I would uh, like to thank you very much. Uh, I hope the others enjoyed the presentation as well, and I hope that we can uh, work together more in the future. Thank you very much. Yes, I look forward to that, and thank you for everyone for participating. So we'll see you again. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.